In NHS healthcare, the quest for better patient care is never-ending. Artificial intelligence has a transformative influence on healthcare. AI helps him analyze patient data faster and more accurately. This leads to precise diagnoses and personalized treatment plans. AI also helps in predicting potential health risks. This proactive approach improves patient outcomes significantly. AI is not replacing doctors, but empowering them. Together, they are revolutionizing healthcare. Empowering the NHS with AI hallmarks a revolution in medical care for a healthier future. Because with AI, better patient care is possible. Uh, allergies to penicillin. The notes tell us that 10% of the population is allergic to penicillin. We actually know the figure is only 1%. So um, we have misleading information in the digital data that we have in medical records. And that is an issue and a problem for us to tease out over the next 10 years. I'm going to hand back to uh, our hosts. But I think we just have to be very careful with the way we move forward. Absolutely. And uh, it will be always good to hear you more. And I hope we can have you in our forthcoming sessions. Your expertise is uh, it's wonderful. And uh, we're privileged to have you in our forum today. So um, our next panelist we have here, Dr. Mala Singh. She's a consultant psychiatrist. Um, her specialty is inpatient assessment and treatment ward. Um, she encourages patients to download the app, which assists them monitoring their mental health. And uh, she'll be briefly talking um, to us about how she, what she thinks, uh, impact of AI. So, Dr. Mala Singh, if you could kindly have some words. Thank you very much. Uh, I personally feel that in my field, uh, the AI will be beneficial in actually predicting suicide risk uh, based on the patient electronic records and their past behavior, their mood, their uh, crisis uh, indicators. So I feel that that would be helpful. And the second thing, it would be helpful in preventative measure. So on electronic patient records, which the GPs have, that will determine the genetic, the lifestyle, and their personal history. Based on that, they can identify people who are more vulnerable to developmental disorder or illness, and preventative measures can be used. So I find that this is a very helpful in our practice. Thank you very much, Ashriya. I don't have anything further to say. Thank you. No, this is really helpful. Thank you. And uh, of course, we cannot have discussion about AI without uh, a software engineer. So there we have. Um, um, now I have Mr. Ashutosh Banerjee. He is a software engineer with uh, more than 10 years of experience and working across travel fintech and e-commerce, and uh, he's an alumni of Bitspilani in India. So, Ashutosh, um, yeah, if you could speak a few words as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, hi. So, um, yeah, so as I'm a software engineer, I, have, I don't really have first-hand experience of how uh, practices and other healthcare institutes are using AI. Uh, Dr. Suvil gave a very good overview as to what case studies and what uh, things can be implemented in the future. Uh, I can share a small amount of insight. Uh, so I have worked at Skyscanner um, and in FinTech in London. So during my time there, there was a lot of um, discussions around using machine learning to improve ranking, sorting of say your mm -hmm. travel itineraries, your flight results. Um, and in FinTech, fraud detection is a huge uh, pain point for mostly every company. So um, those are two areas which have really gone deep into using machine learning and more AI generative techniques. Similarly, like in generative AI, um, using customer support, um, making them more aware of the options they have to quickly serve a customer or give them or giving a customer directly options to self-serve them really improves the efficiency of the organization in itself. Um, one thought would be that whenever I have worked with data scientists and machine learning practitioners, 
data cleansing has been a big problem. And given that we would we are talking about AI in healthcare, patient data and confidentiality are a really big uh, problematic pain point. So anonymization of that data and uh, making sure that PII information not leaking into systems would be a um, good thing to guard against uh, going forwards. Uh, yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our my, our next panelist is Ms. Mehzabeen Warsi. Um, she is a musculoskeletal uh, advanced practitioner in NHS in Leicester. Uh, Mez is on the screen. So thank you, Mez, for joining. We can see you're in the clinic still. So uh, yeah, if you can share a few words. So um, I've been using AI for um, obviously prescribing exercises sometimes to do my research work as well. Um, what would benefit us with especially dealing with chronic pain conditions is that, you know, we, we usually see a patient once and then we don't see them for at least eight to 12 weeks. And we don't know whether the patients are really compliant. Um, and using AI would help in understanding the other factors that contribute to uh, their chronic pain. So this is a very good way forward. And also diagnosing MSK conditions early will help in, you know, preventing chronic conditions. So I think uh, this is a very good platform and good way forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Bhagishi. Thank you. So we are um, here. We are almost ready to take questions. We have another two panelists, but I can't see them here. Um, I don't know, Zermin, if you can monitor the questions from the audience. And yeah. So uh, respectfully, I just want to take involve uh, involve Dr. Rahil. I think he has not spoken. Uh, Dr. Rahil, can you hear us? I can give a quick introduction. Um, yeah. yeah, Dr. Rahil Mehboob, he is a consultant psychiatrist, a very active member of Conservative Friends of NHS. And uh, Dr. Mehboob, if you would like to say two words about, about your experience, your view of AI in healthcare. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me. Yeah, my experience is, I would say, similar to Dr. Singh, Mala Singh. I also work in the inpatient psychiatric department and also worked in the uh, community settings as well. I would say this is a very good thing for preventive measures, especially, um, like she said, in generating the risk factors to develop any psychiatric disorders. And also it will be very helpful in triaging the crisis patients, which which is, which is used as a crisis line or a lot of methods has been tried which are not very successful. So I think this will increase the process and which will triage the patients and help them guide them to the pathway to and help saving many lives so i think this is a very good thing thank you very much can i invite suzy webb and bhakshri can you introduce Susie yes webb? yes suzy it's uh, today one of our uh, panelists and uh, a very dear member of conservative friends of nhs she's a retired barrister but now sits on a couple of charitable uh, boards. She's a president of Scout District and a board member and a trustee of a uh, senior governor of a Muslim sixth form college. She is the executive committee member of the Conservative Muslim Forum uh, and Church of England member and a member of Dinary Synod, uh, which is the ruling body for her church. So Susie, uh, thank you again for joining. And uh, if you could share a few words, we'll would be grateful. Um, I'm very happy to be here because I actually am not all that enthusiastic about AI and the speed at which it's coming at us. Um, as a patient, um, not as a professional, I think that I prefer the personal touch. But as a professional, I think face-to-face uh, -face tells me a lot more and what I hear or answers written on a paper. Now, as a barrister, uh, my uh, clients, offenders, whatever you want to call them, used to say one thing, but I knew the truth was something else. Now, it's not quite the same in medicine, obviously, but I could tell you I've got a headache and I itch here, but if you're looking at me, you may think, ah, 
she's a bit yellow there and why is she doing that and you pick up so much more from face to face and whilst I think AI has its place I don't believe it has its place in the full way that I'm hearing about um, and also the people who program the AI will they be responsible for the accuracy of what they've asked for and therefore the responses they receive because if I go and see a consultant and he gives me a completely wrong diagnos diagnosis which I have to say has never happened to me but you know I'm looking at the possibilities then there is some sort of uh, comeback if you like I can speak to someone I can get another opinion but AI who do I speak to it's all about contact and also trust. I trust my consultant. I trust my GP. Frankly, I don't trust a program on a computer that's pumped out all these questions for me to answer. You know, I, I may sound quite naive in all of this, but I think in diagnosis, once you've got the actual um, problems, AI could work it out very quickly, but I don't think informing the diagnosis, uh, AI could ask enough questions because you need to be face to face. Uh, I've had a couple of tel telephone appointments with consultants recently, and I have to say I wasn't in the least bit happy about them. Very nice people, but I still felt that I should be there in a room so the consultant could properly understand what was wrong with me or disagree with me. Because if I fill out a piece of paper, you don't know if I have filled out something that I think is true, but actually I'm just being ridiculous. But a consultant will know I'm being ridiculous by the fact that I'm sitting there and he can see other things that I don't see in myself. Um, I don't know if I, I can say much more about it, except I think AI has a place, but more in the administration side of things, not in diagnosis and patient care. As a patient, I would not be happy with it. Susie, um, can I tell you a story, a very brief story? Uh, I have a very sophisticated car and I can speak to it but it doesn't understand the Scottish language, <laughs> the yes, Scottish yes. accent. So I think AI has a long way to go because it's got to cope with different accents as well as uh, giving bot type responses. I, I want to address what she has just mentioned. Um, uh, first of all, let me, let me just uh, explain that explainability of AI is a big issue. That why AI has come to this solution, that is a big issue. But we need to remember one thing, that the generative AI is less than two years old for the commercial market. Uh, that is uh, something I wanted to mention. And Professor, uh, you mentioned the AI in cars. Remember the I, in the beginning of the talk when you were not here, I mentioned that the cars use the standard AI technology not the generative AI technology. The reason is very simple. I repeat what I said before, that if you ask the car, take right, take me to, take me to my home, and suddenly you want to stop at McDonald's, the car may refuse. It's not good for your health. I will not stop here. The car will go straight on, go past the McDonald's, because it will check your cholesterol before you, you could go to uh, take a Big Mac. Generative AI is autonomous, self-adaptive. Traditional AI, is safe and workable, but transition is very good. So I, I, I want to invite uh, Stosh on that and tell us more about the implementation problems within NHS. You're a technical guy and please enlighten us. Um, so uh, a lot of the systems are actually autonomous even before generative where there was unstructured uh, and unsupervised learning. The problem like what you're mentioning is that it's accurate, like AI is not a silver bullet for most solutions as of now. There's a lot of rules and guidelines and additional structuring that you need to do 
to basically make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, detecting accents, for example, Scottish accents, definitely it would be a, a different kind of data set. Maybe it's not yet equipped for that, but there are improvements there. But the idea would be to probably take off the load from the healthcare professionals in triaging, in reducing the amount of manual work that goes on in healthcare at the moment. And that itself will give a big enough boost so that people can directly look at something which is more streamlined. And uh, it's more of an indicator. I think it will take years before it can automatically give us accuracy where we don't need human intervention. But it can definitely give us good indicator as to what might be a particular prognosis before someone with expertise can actually, you know, elaborate and use that. So yeah, that's for you. Thank you, Ashtori. This is very enlightening. I want to take it to uh, uh, Dr. Mala. She she mentioned about the suicidal tendency in AI. I can I can inform you, perhaps you already know that the facial yeah. gesture, <laughs> the voice timbre. Oh, I, th I think your, mic your, your microphone is uh, giving echo. So I'll just uh, make it uh, s s mute for the time being. So the voice timbre, the facial gestures, they are being studied when telepsychiatric consultations are happening. And they are being scored towards the end that comparing to last appointment, this patient looks withdrawn. The, the nasolabial fold has gone deeper. The facial angle is dropping. The eyes have got sunken in and the voice is low and depressive and he's forgetting while speaking. All this report will be available in the side panel while you're doing a telepsychiatry. Uh, please share your thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Mala. Looking forward to this coming into the practice because I deal with female inpatients and the dilemma happens usually before discharge or for someone who has got a history of significant history of self-harm. And it would help me because in all the electronic patient records, it will give out a data to say, yes, this patient is safe to be discharged. What are the likelihood that this patient will relapse within the next 14 days? What type of intervention is required? So for me, I am actually looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, I think we have two more minutes for the panel before we go to the Chloe. But Dr. Rahil, please share more light on your work. Uh, you, you didn't really give us some details. Uh, can you do that? Yeah, I, I work in the inpatient settings in the male ward, but I've worked in the community as well. I think this is very important. You mentioned about the facial recognition. We do something we call it mental state examination in which mm. appearance and behavior is a major part of that, which usually shows us the state of the patient and the risk and all that. So I think if this is something which is in the, which is in the, in the notes or computerized and when we see patients which we haven't seen in the past, Maybe the if we can have those things when we see them uh, next time and we can compare them and that would be very helpful in deciding about the patient's progress actually. And that will also help us. Sometimes they have been triaged by many people who are not even sometimes medics as well or when they're triaged so, or in the screening type. So I think this will, when we see us, it will really assist us in making the decisions. Yeah. I agree that human element is important, especially in our field. And we cannot rely on the this uh, the human touch is very important, but this will really assist us uh, in screening and prevention actually, and also in the outpatient settings. This, as in the GP setting, it will really help us in in the patients who are the right ones to get the appointments uh, uh, before. So it will really be very helpful and will reduce the uh, the timing as well of of the clinics and the appointments. I think I would completely uh, agree with uh, Dr. Rahil and uh, um, what um, um, Susie was saying as well, because um, I just remembered I, very quickly, I'll say last week, I had a video consultation with a patient who complained of back pain. And uh, she just, uh, because it was on video, of course, I could see a lot. But um, for some reason, it, the symptom did seem non-musculoskeletal. So I just called her to clinic. And I just, as soon as she entered the room, her eyes were yellow. She had turned pale. Her nails were yellow. It was very obvious that, you know, she was probably having some hepatitic, uh, you know, jaundice and I had to immediately refer for GP. So 
Yes, I think, um, of course, AI, but uh, as Ashu, uh, Ashutosh mentioned about the workload in terms of the admin job, uh, what we are really struggling at the moment, and I think there's a lot of backlog because of the admin issue. I think AI has a tremendous role in that. But when it comes to very clinical entity, maybe it's always a, uh, sort of questionable, just something very personally, I feel. I, I think it's part of the journey. We questioned everything when it started, but we started uh, ad adapting and praising later on. So we still are not far ahead to make conclusion whether it's for us or not. It is the beginning. Um, I want to also take comments of uh, Mass uh, in her practice, uh, being a musculoskeletal specialist, that do you see AI actually saving you time? Um, it definitely helps um, using AI. So, so I think I'll, I'll take using AI answer. definitely helps in saving time, especially writing uh, letters to consultants. Yeah. I, I think that's that's an area where we got to be very careful, because when you write letters to consultants, may I suggest not to put the patient's name in chat GPT? May I suggest not to put the patient's addresses in chat GPT? You can Absolutely. put the context yeah. that can you summarize this context for me without patients' names and addresses and postcodes and telephone numbers and emails. Prof. Wallace, your final comment before we hand it back for Croyer. Prof. Wallace. I think we have an exciting future over the next 10 years. I think we are right at the beginning of it. Uh, I, um, uh, I am skeptical about some of the clinical uh, things that people think they can achieve. And I actually uh, fall with Susie on that. Uh, I think that uh, you just have to be very careful, but on the admin side, there is a huge amount that can be achieved. And uh, when you think now that we have um, cars that, uh, are adaptive cruise control vehicles that virtually drive themselves on our roads at the present time, then surely we should be using that sort of AI type technology to improve our patient care. So I'm for it, but I do think we're only at the beginning of the journey. That will AI be useful for giving to public openly at this point? I think AI will be very good in helping with administration, documentation, but I do not believe that AI can assess a patient's health, especially just asking the patient questions, because the patient is often, they can tell you what they feel, but there are other things to do with their condition that a consultant face-to-face -face can actually see or can pursue further to see if there is another symptom that the patient hasn't remarked upon. Um, and I think human contact is essential. It's supportive. And this may sound a bit uh, soft, but uh, a lot of people feel better, not, uh, not cured, but better by the fact that they've spoken to a person who actually knows all about their condition and has some idea how to fix it and can tell them so. They feel reassured. And sometimes that reassurance can actually help in the healing process for people. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for the valuable comment. And Bhakshri, up to you now to, to take it forward. The words close. Yep. That's fine. Um, sorry, if I may. Um, with Dr. Chitta, you were mentioning about the photo pictures before. Um, again, being a clinician, I'll be skeptical about, uh, um, you know, the AI. But with the, um, at currently, we have the wait time for to see a dermatologist, a consultant dermatologist would be probably, you know, more than nine, uh, you know, nine weeks or 10 weeks. But recently in my GP practices, um, uh, safely, I can say, uh, with the help of the pictures and dermoscope, and the help of some of the features, I don't know exactly what uh, features of AI, 
things have been escalated. So maybe selectively AI helps in certain area of in, in, in some, it may not be. Um, but anyway, thank you everyone. And uh, special thanks to uh, Professor Angus Wallace. Thanks for your time. And thank you. Thanks to everyone who spent their evening. It's not easy on weekdays. You know, we all are here. So um, we look forward. This will continue with the help of Dr. Chiptai and uh, Dr. Chauhan, who is uh, the president of our Conservative Friends of NHS. We will conduct this webinar this month, every week. So uh, please join all of you and spend your valuable time. And okay. we'll learn. We all are clinicians and we also have engineers and people from other fields. So only when we discuss things, we'll learn from each other. So thank you.